Alright, back for part two of the physics conversation with somebody who has the channel named John fucking Wayne. Yeah, it's probably, probably not a productive activity. Anyway. Uh, I'm with the show and such. I'm supposed to be getting to the point now. So, it should be very exciting. <laughs> I lost the hat. Here we go. Oh, the new hat. Get the desk. This yeah. is. Your mummy buy you that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Christmas present. A. Hey, uh, this thing actually lets me see the universe um, from the point of view of uh, a, 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 a machine. And what it does is it lets me, it takes an input and, uh, like light and sound, and it, in, and it outputs ones and zeros. Okay, so. Very exciting. I, I, I just don't understand. So you keep doing all these arguments from the origin or something like that. I just don't understand why you think that would be at all compelling to me, that it makes any difference. If, if, if by corpuscle, Newton meant, um, you know, it was made out of banana juice, or it was made out of fairies, or or leprechauns, or pixies. What's what's the difference? The, we're describing what has character as as something that can be separated as individuals. What can be called a uh, you know? It's just like saying there's a bunch of these, you know, this human. Uh, it's it's like a sponge or something. Is the sponge the sponge or the sponge the cells? Well, it's obviously the cells. And it's just a colony that makes a sponge. But there's something deeper to be able to see here in physics. Okay, physics isn't you're a human being. Physics is you're a bunch of atoms. And the atoms have a subtly different geometry. And those make the different chemicals. And, you know, I'm just saying, I don't, do, do, do I really have to go all the way back and explain that physics to you? I mean, the eighth grade shit? So, what I'm seeing is I see in this ice eyepiece, there's just a string of ones and zeros in here, okay? So, when I look around, I'm not actually seeing a wall, a light bulb. Right, so you're like Neo in the Matrix. Yeah, you see like little streams of shit. Who cares? It's still walls, it's still things, so who cares? A camera, my hand, some books on a bookshelf. I don't see that. What I see are ones and zeros. And they don't really mean anything to me. They don't really have any meaning. Uh, but uh, fortunately, I can you know push this little switch here, and uh, now I can see. Now, now it has turned all the ones and zeros into an image that I can understand. Okay. Um, you know, this is. Uh, so all this nonsense, because he's defending some notion that the origin of the universe isn't simple mechanical things. Little doesn't get simpler. No. And and the thing that's internal, that the, the eternal God is the ether, whatever, the jello mediums, the the bent space ether and the electro ether and the magno ether. Those are the universe. Um, this is, uh, you know, this is like a, a, a theatrical device, okay? I, I can't really see anything through this uh, mask, but uh, if I could, let, let's suppose that I were, uh, let's suppose this were a robot, okay? Or, 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 no, or, we just did a whole bunch of useless supposing. Can't we just give up on this useless supposing and get to something called a piece of evidence in the actual trial of who's an imbecile and who's not? The evidence that you're an imbecile is the fact that we're 20 minutes into this video, you haven't made a single argument that I could, that any reasonable person could say, ah, yes, that's a relevant salient point. No, you've made a bunch of babbly arguments about how you know what the universe is ultimately made out of because you have a special imagination device. Or about a computer, and we're uh, doing a video recording of, uh, you know, the, the outside world. Now, in, actually, this thing is a night vision goggle. These are night vision goggles, and that's exactly what it's doing. It's actually taking. Uh, it... Let's understand. He harassed me to respond to this video. I mean, he posts three different links to it in on different channels to to drag me to this shit of an argument 
a digital image and then converting it into a, a little um, little into ones and zeros, and then it converts it back into an image that's projected onto a little screen inside of this. And uh, so, how does the brain know? I mean, all this information here is just ones and zeros. That's the information that we get processed in the brain uh, and uh, acquire meaning. Well, your superficial description of how the device functions demonstrates that you really don't want to talk about the actual physics because it's all the things that you just said are all correlated, so strictly correlated. I mean, they're not just ones and zeros. The ones say there's a photon that hit here, and the zero says no photon hit here. So it's sort of relevant, silly person. Uh, that's, that's an interesting question. It's not one I'm going to really pursue in this video, but it is one to... Uh, consider on your own time. So how how do you how can you claim anything as fact? Okay, so if you make a statement of, of fact, like the tons cannot travel with respect to a fixed frame, otherwise you would notice. What does that mean? I mean, uh, the tons cannot travel as regard to a fixed frame, or otherwise we would notice. Who who's, who who made this argument? Where where in my video can you show me a quote where I said those words? It's whatever that crap is. I didn't say it. Again, why would I even use arguments of silly <coughs> frame arguments? Again, frames that you... I don't mean they're real frames, except when I mean to argue they're real frames. I mean, they're not like UFO spaceships, except when it's to my convenience to make them UFO separate universes. <laughs> I mean, this is just such cr shit crock. Really, that's just a string of ones and zeros, and it takes your mind to process it and make it comprehensible. Okay, so one of the ways that uh, the mind does this is it uses constructs. Okay, uh, like and so, so again, this is his theory is, is the universe is made out of ones and zeros. Okay, so he's saying the... And again, if he correlated that to some kind of reality, like there are the smallest little quanta bits, and we call that an on, and the, the empty space around it, we call that an off then I would be in perfect agreement. I don't care. You want to call it a one? You want to call it a... Uh, call it anything. I don't care. It's a quantized bit of energy that has completely discrete, completely contained properties. Okay, I'm in. There's a checkerboard and there's checkers. Yeah, I'll go for that. Feynman would have gone for that reference range, for example, and it, it conceives of what would the universe look like if, if light traveled with respect to one uh, reference frame and none other, and uh, it, would, it would look different than the universe that we live in. Okay, that's just a, he's, his, his claim. He's got some sort of claim that he knows the universe changes if I don't allow light to gain two momentums, and that's completely untrue. There's nothing in common experience that you would notice any difference whatsoever because None of this silly light crap, none of this time dilation shit actually happens at, you know, our common experience, okay? Um, and again, the changes in atomic clocks can be merely explained as an association between velocity and the decay rate of the um, atoms that are actually moving. And that moving changes the atoms, and that's why they decay at a different rate. It's because moving isn't nothing. Moving isn't just, I hit you and you magically keep going. No, when I hit you, force went into you. And that force is distracting you. It's occupying your atoms. It's changed their structure. They've gained a, a, a different disposition, a different, pro different properties. They have new properties now because I hit it. Now, your silly notion that that's not true, and your silly notion that somehow the universe changes, and yet you don't point out how it would possibly change. If we say light always travels the speed of light, and gravity always travels the speed of light regardless of frames, show me how this universe that we live in changes. Show me how I need relativistic frames to, make, to explain this world that we live in, the speeds we're going at. It's only your theoretical nonsense is where you get to play your little wacky games. You can't bend this reality. There are no photons moving two momentums here. Okay, because when we perform experiments that measure... So when we have apparatus, apparati, they can measure distance, and it can measure the tiniest change in distance, like an interferometer, for example. Uh, you know, there's actually videos that show... Okay, so another example where... He knows that they're actually measuring the, the 
nanometer difference between um, you know light in perfect phase different photons in perfect phase with each other and he, they're measuring the actual nanometer difference between say 450 nanometer light and 449 nanometer light uh, the pattern of the interferometer changing as a function of the distance between uh, the mirror here and one of the um, uh, mirrors here, uh, or, or the laser. Yes, or no, and again, this is under dispute, and this is going to, this is going to be his his argument to uh, to um, resolve the dispute. Is he somehow going to provide evidence that he knows the interferometer is actually measuring? the length of the light beam and it's not measuring the movement of a mirror <laughs> yeah he knows he has facts of some kind oh that's right he won't have any of those it's actually yeah you can actually see the old word actually you actually see with your own eyes well not really your eyes but it's actually taking in <laughs> right now now if they'd actually done an experiment where they took a gigantic weight okay and they placed it above the mirror, you know, the mirror containment room, and they just swung it back and forth, and they saw that period on the, on the interferometer, so they demonstrated that just moving any mass near the mirror, or near the device, would change the length of the device, change space-time, warp the space-time around the mirror, well then you could make this argument. But we don't have any evidence they ever did any such experiments to test how sensitive the device was to movement of matter. So you, all these claims that somehow you know that's what's happening when they never tested the device. You have no way to compare it to any other thing than their claim they saw something four billion light years away. Besides their claim, there's no evidence corroborating the fact that any of it's true. Not a shred of corroborating evidence. <laughs> and somehow this is his evidence that the evidence from which they're basing their conclusions is solid evidence. So this is, the, the claim is your evidence is too weak for a conviction. Way too weak. Like insanely too weak. And your counter argument is just to keep claiming, look I have all this weak evidence. <laughs> Shit. Back to the image which then goes to your eyeballs. And uh, presumably this information is still just a bunch of ones and zeros in a sense. Your mind comprehends it. And you can actually see the, um, the pattern. Okay. Yes, the pattern. Let's talk about the pattern, what the pattern's made out of. And the argument is you say the pattern's made out of perturbations in mediums of jello-y stuff. And I'm saying, no, the pattern's made out of, like, I would analogize it to birds in a flock, uh, sponge cells in a sponge, or fish in a school of fish. There are actual individual elements with individual properties that are making the pattern. And they hit things that change the pattern, called matter. So the force is a bunch of free little bits, and depending on what kind of structure, filters you build out of matter, you can force the pattern to change. On the interferometer, uh, shifting as as you change the distance in the legs of the interferometer. Okay. Um, and you can make all these all these all this bullshit about how uh, uh, it's, it's actually um, you know it's, it's being uh, interfered with or it's uh, it, no, whatever. Fuck you. Okay. It, 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 yeah, yeah, fuck you <laughs> if you force us to like present real evidence in a trial who says we have to do that can't we just make shit up and everybody just falls for it fuck you for being rational and critical oh yeah that's just totally silly fuck you just believe what they say believe what my pope says I love my pope interferometer is used to measure distance and when you use this interferometer and you keep it on all day and you notice that the Three pattern does not change, it does not shift throughout the day. Yeah, and you spend a billion dollars on it, and yet you don't create a single test. You don't create one mechanical test to see if it can actually detect bent space by bending some space. You just take a heavy weight and swing it right next to the, the 
two mile long tunnel. If you just do it from one section, just swing a heavy mass next to it, you'll get a change in the bent space. You'll get a change. You'll you'll end up injecting a bunch of extra space inside of the inside of the photons and wing wang them. You know, with your special ether movement. So why not create a test for your fucking idiotic instrument? You're going to claim it does supernatural things, and yet you haven't one fucking test for it. A billion dollars, and you couldn't afford to build a test. You know. I mean, anybody who builds a car from scratch or something based on some theory, they're going to test it, <laughs> you know. They're not going to just sit there and say, oh, yeah, I know it works without testing it. Sure. The Earth, uh, the, the reference frame, the ship is rotating like this. It's rotating. So if you have an inertial reference frame and we're sitting in it, then the Earth is rotating through it. Uh, it only is rotating. Oh, yeah, it's through the frame that doesn't really exist as a reality. It's just a metaphor or an analogy. <laughs> Except it's moving through the analogy. I, again, this this crack shit of they're not real frames. Except when I want to argue, then they're real. Yes, it's also rotating this way too because it's circling the sun. And when you don't see a shift in the fringe pattern, uh, that means that. Uh, <sighs> okay, so again, he's going back to the interferometer argument. I just made that in the last video. So, how does this make any sense? I just pointed out how the the, the beam splitter and the mirror, okay, and all the other adjacent mirrors. So you can just 18, you can take 18 mirrors and just look at them as uh, initiation points for a photon reflecting. And, it's, and if you just count whether it's going, uh, you know, how much of a change there is in this direction or how much of a change in this direction, if you add them all up, it comes out to zero. The emitter moves, okay, the photon's released. That's okay. You start the clock because now the other end is moving. Okay, so the other end is apparently moving away. You're stretching the space. Uh, as soon as you reflect from the other end, then you're compressing the space because now the 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 beam splitter is moving too. So it's going to move exactly as much as the mirror moved, except in the opposite direction. Well, it's in the same direction. But because the photon's traveling in the opposite direction, it obviously has the exact opposite effect. It, it shortens the path where you lengthen the path going. So the path is longer going, the path is shorter, coming back, zero. So I already pointed this out. How many times do I have to point it out? Your interferometer can't possibly do what you claim it can do. It, what it can do is detect mirrors moving. Yes, if the mirror moves, you can detect that. If the distance changes, you can't detect that because it's inverse to its each other. The reverse path undoes everything the forward path did. Moron! One of two things. One possibility is that the inertial reference frame um, that light travels in just happens to coincide with whatever orientation the Earth is in, linking the Earth to the center of the universe. Or, alternatively, <laughs> Um, okay, so there's just, again, the argument is you have weak evidence and that you jump to conclusions. That's what you're on trial for. And you're just demonstrating how, look, you must believe the interferometer because we've proven it and it's demonstrated. Except we never demonstrated it with any experiment that tested the instrument. So we have no way to test the instrument, we didn't test the instrument, and we're going to claim what it does. And yet, you can easily point out how, look, if you just look at this thing logically, it can't possibly do what you're claiming it can do because you keep moving the mirrors. The mirrors move with the earth. It, you can't do what you're claiming to do. It would mean that uh, your theory is wrong. Okay. That's what it would prove. Okay, so he says it proves it. So again, what else can I say? If this is your standard for proof, it's ludicrous. It's, it's insipid. It's silly. Darwin proved evolution. He pinned a bunch of birds to the fucking goddamn board. He punched, a, he put a bunch of turtle shells. He did a bunch of shit to explain how it works. All right, evidence. He tested his theory by going everywhere. He talked to a pigeon guy. Say, how do you breed these pigeons? Well, we selectively breed them. And then he, he talked to the sheep guy and found out how they do that. This, you're not providing any evidence for your theory. You're just making these bold claims for 150-year-old experiments and what they prove or didn't prove. And I've demonstrate how your rationale for how the experiment works is flawed. 
overtly wrong. You think it can work, and it can be demonstrated that it can't even theoretically do what you think it does. It's not even theoretically possible, retard. Uh, and you can say, well, it's, it's a, the light is, is diffracting into you know, thousands of places, and somehow, even though diffraction is a wave phenomenon, uh, somehow the fact that light is diffracting... <laughs> uh, wave diffracting. <laughs> see, 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 see anytime, anytime you want to use a word, so you, you can't use any kind of word that has to do with frequencies. It's always got to be a wavelength. And clearly, you can't talk about things diverging, okay, and use words that are, that are synonyms for divergence without them calling that wave spreading. So there, there's just no hope. They, they claim to own every word in the vocabulary is now a wave word. Um, so, you know, I'm not allowed to use any words that are in the dictionary because they've waved all of them. It's a, it's a wave word diffraction. You, it's not, it has nothing to do with words that are similar, like reflection, deflection, diffraction. No, no, it's not similar to those words at all. In an interferometer, which it, it isn't anyway, but you, you, say, you claim it is. <sighs> okay, he says it isn't anyway. Does he have any evidence that it isn't anyway? Does he have any evidence that the beam doesn't get diverged by going through the beam splitter? Where's his evidence that that doesn't happen? That the two patterns are, in fact, Newton ringed, okay? Both trips, as soon as you go through the diffraction gradient, that is, you go through the beam splitter, not reflect off the mirror, your beam gets Newton ringed then. And one of the beams gets Newton ringed wider than the other beam. So the rings don't match necessarily. Obviously, they can match on um, um, what do you call the uh, on harmonics. Okay, so there'll be certain certain positions, certain enlargements will overlap and fit, but certain enlargements won't. It's not. Uh, but let, let's let's take uh, let, let's assume that you're right, and it's it's actually. That's what's causing this fringe pattern. The fringe pattern changes as a function of distance. Again, and I'm saying that it doesn't change as a function of distance. It changes as a function of the mirror moving. The mirror moves that changes the uh, phase of the light that's going to reflect off of it. And I'm going to, go to argue that it's not really the phase of the light. It's the phase of the admitting energy. In the Michelson-Morley experiment, they used white light. Why do you think they used white light? It doesn't make any sense. Everybody knows that it's all these patterns show up much better with monochromatic light. Why did they use white light? Multi-phased white light. Why don't you explain that? Okay, I'll go two legs. So if you change the distance of one leg, right? So you have the, the, two, the double mirror here and then you have another mirror over here and you change the distance, the fringe pattern should shift as a function of the distance. That's what mirror parameters are using. Yeah, yes, as a function of the mirror moving. Yes, the mirror moving will change the, the whatever frequency is built into the light. So again, the argument would be the energy that emitted their light, it was a synthetic, again. Um, it's, it's, it wasn't a natural source of light, like the sun. And even the sun, we know, isn't coherent light. I mean, in the sense of coherent in that the photons aren't all in phase. So how can you see a phase shift with light that's not in phase? Somehow you have to impose some other um, frequency, some other wavelength on it. You have to put a carrier. It has to be a carrier wave somewhere. And that's what you're detecting the difference in. Do you have evidence that isn't the truth? I don't think you do. Why did they use white light? for the use for calibrating distance. Um, yeah, it, 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 so, so you have to explain why, if it's just diffraction, why that shift occurs as a function of increasing or decreasing distance. And even if it was caused by diffraction, you, you cannot deny... Uh, again, so he, th th this, this assumption, I didn't say that the diffraction was causing the difference in the pattern. What I said was they haven't accounted for its effect. Who knows what its complete effect is? I mean, obviously you're comparing, you have a circle this big, a bullseye this big, and you have a bullseye this big, and you're overlapping them, and what will be the consequence in terms of 
changes in a pattern based on that. Um, I don't know what they would be. But my argument against the interferometer is that it's not measuring distance, it's measuring mirrors moving. Oh, shit. Say that the shift is a function of distance, and therefore it would be able to measure um, an absolute reference frame, regardless of the cause of the fringe pattern. It doesn't matter why the fringe pattern occurs, it would be able to measure... Okay, it says, he says it would be able to measure an absolute frame. That is, you could move, no matter where you move it, the experiment, you could... You could show when the experiment's moving that somehow the path lengths are different. I've already demonstrated that isn't the truth. The instrument can't do that. You can move it all the fuck you want, and you can't possibly change the, the distance between the mirror and the true emitter, which is the beam splitter. So you can't change the distance between when the photon first pops out of the beam splitter and where the where the where the reflected photon first reflects back into reality out of, out of the mirror. Those distances will always be the same. The distance from the beam it splitter to the moving mirror and from the moving mirror back to the moving beam splitter, those two distances will always be the same. In, in the direction of the motion. The funny one is the, the a tangential alarm is the one where you might get some change because you're changing where it sits on the slope of a mirror. And, and that's, uh, so, so I've, already, I've already made these arguments and you're, you're not contending them. And again, the whole point I said was is Michelson Morley actually had results consistent with the idea that the wrong arm was the one creating the, the, the greater distance. That's the irony of this conversation, douche. Um, what it's trying to measure, which is an absolute reference frame. And since it doesn't do that, your theory's wrong. Period. End of story. Uh, okay. Period. End of story. There. He thinks that's sufficient evidence to say. Period. End of story. So uh, a, a theoretically uh, dicey instrument, never tested, and he claims he now has proof of the non-existence of an absolute frame. So that's all it takes for these imbeciles, and they're the ones saying they're the science preservers. They're the one trying to protect science from the crazy, reckless looney tunes, from the little the tin foil hat cookers. They're the ones protecting science from people who would jump to preposterous conclusions based on, I saw the ghost of Morley, you know, in the tree bark. Uh, you know, you're the people jumping to the conclusions and jumping to the wackiest conclusions possible. Not a rational explanation. Um, no, it's always, yes, there is Sasquatch. Yes, aliens have visited us. Yes, the CIA, uh, you know, t t Joe Kennedy was a fucking robot. Story. Um, no mas. <laughs> All right, so let's, let's just get this shit over with. Okay, so here's the arguments. Uh, you, you say that nobody ever makes any arguments, so here's some fucking arguments that you may have missed over the, you know. Ah, finally an argument. Oh, you mean it's actually going to be rational and evidence-based? Oh, oh, I'm so horny for this. Years that you've been arguing this shit. Um, the, all right, here's an argument. The gravity must have inelastic collisions, okay? Otherwise, conservation of energy is violated. Um... I've already done this, okay, so again, he has nothing, all right? I've already explained how they're completely conservative in terms of all the energy is accounted for, and he's basically telling me that somehow this can't hit this, this goes this way, and this goes that way. Somehow that can't happen. Uh, yeah, it can. Fuck you. Changes if, if, um, if, if, if they were elastic, okay, mathematically, the forces would cancel. So you have a, a body here, and uh, you, have, you have a ton that comes in. Okay, so again, yes, they would if, if guess what? See, the key problem for you, Bozo, as I've explained seven million times, is, yes, if they're both the same color, let's say, or the same as square, and uh, they're, they're squares hitting squares, and there's nothing else to distinguish that one is different than the other, then this, or this collision looks just like two things passing each other and you couldn't tell the difference. But if one of them's red and one of them's black or one of them's round and one of them's square, well then you'll realize when the two things hit, they, the, the round one's going a new direction and the square one's going a new direction 
it changes the, their direction. Now, I, this is a, the fucking premise that's, you know, five years old. I've argued it to death. People complain that, why are you repeating yourself? Because these assholes keep bringing this shit up. Like, this is an argument. This is my, I'm going to now nail you into your coffin of your guilty, and here's the evidence, a preposterous uh, straw man that has absolutely nothing to do with the theory you've actually proposed. I mean, what a fucking piece of work. I mean, you people just so fucking suck. This is the game you play. And it bounces like this, and it doesn't lose any velocity, it doesn't lose any force. Then when, when it bounces, when it rebounds, it would bounce off of the other object. And then mathematically, all of these forces, all of these vectors would cancel with each other. And so there wouldn't... Win- it's nonsense, right? Okay, we already know that that's nonsense in the sense that every time energy goes into something, we can follow it. It, it, we can follow it. We can trace it. Changes something. It's it, the this thing gets it goes into a battery. It comes back out of the battery. It doesn't get destroyed. It doesn't go into any kind of fifteenth uh, dimension or something. It's all traceable and it always keeps going. So that's just nonsense. Photons don't slow down, retard. Any effective force. It would be like if you have two perfectly uh, reflective spheres uh, in a, a room filled with light. Uh, they would not cast a shadow on each other. And that's a fact. And you can say it's not. You have two perfectly reflective spheres, and you shine a light on them. Now, don't you understand how you have to be a little more specific than that? Because obviously, depending on where you shine the light, it can't reflect between the two spheres. By definition, the two spheres diverge the light, and all the light will dissipate. You're an idiot. A fact, but you were wrong. Okay, this isn't a matter of opinion. This is a matter of geometry. <laughs> Um, okay, so he says he's proven something with some sort of geometry. So he knows the geometry of these little discrete bits. He knows the geometry of electrons and protons. He knows what a muon looks like, how it's shaped. He has all that figured out, so he accounts for the fact that all these things are okay. They don't, they don't have to obey his uh, strict rules of uh, spherical collisions. <laughs> yeah, fuck you again. And if, yeah, but, but then if... if uh... Another argument is, uh, what if, um, what if, what if you did actually? Because your argument is that uh, what you say is that mainstream physics has a bunch of mathematical formulas, but they don't have any explanations. Um, but this- uh, that's not what I say. So again, just don't quote me some more. Uh, what I say is they don't have a model, and their model isn't consistent with their math, and that's why they have to invent dark matter and Huygens and Heisenberg and all kinds of gimmicks to create rules that make their math work but it doesn't work and uh, you know in a lot of cases and again I've already argued that I'm perfectly happy with Maxwell's equations even though he thought of them as wave equations because they do exactly what I claim happens which is a bunch of force moving straight lines there's not waves of magnetism okay there really aren't Uh, there aren't waves of electricity going through wires okay it's force going through wires and it's polarized there's no necessity to have waves of it. The only reason why you even generate something might even be called a wave is because you have to collapse and then um, relax. You have to compress electrons and once you've compressed them you have to relax it for them to move back so you can compress them again. You can't compress them again if you didn't let them relax. Not really true. Uh mainstream physics does have explanations. They explain in terms of a wave phenomenon, in terms of that space. Uh, yeah, yeah, so again, I'm just saying that's totally unnecessary to describing what happens. So the fact that you want to think of it as waves, the fact that Maxwell believed in an ether, well, that's his problem. There's no need to believe in it, and there's certainly his math doesn't dictate the existence of it. So Again, this is just bogus. It's like saying Einstein demonstrated that there's no inverse square law uh, that's mechanical, that somehow it's made out of bent space. Well, he didn't prove that that's what's happening when light's admitted. He didn't prove that in all the other cases where the inverse square law applies, that somehow it's always bent space that causes it. No, the inverse square law is a phenomenon created by uh, mechanical bits, by any pressure system is going to create that law. Any evenly distributed pressure is going to create an inverse square law of 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 its 
it's divergence with distance radial divergence and you don't like these explanations but that doesn't mean that they, they're not they don't exist all right again another false canard i don't like what explanation you didn't provide any explanation you didn't provide number one the math i disagree with you didn't show this perfect formula that i refute you didn't show you didn't give evidence where somehow the math can only work in a wave context and it can't possibly be uh, perceived as a uh, straight line force when of course Maxwell's all his equations work perfectly by creating things called virtual photons as as Richard Feynman would call them to create magnetism he didn't he didn't create virtual wave tons he didn't say some other bullshit no they were straight line force being emanated straight line force coming out of a magnet not waves of anything no Huygens necessary there. Um, and, and you could actually create a mathematical, you could create mathematical formulas that describe your theory. Um, and it would look insane. It would be, you know, it would be, you know. It, it, uh, again, a lie. Yeah, it would be the inverse square law. It would be uh, uh, virtual, uh, real photons moving in straight line paths at a constant speed, just like the model for magnetism they have that doesn't have any real carrier. So I give you a real carrier instead. That's right. The electromagnetic spectrum is made out of real stuff moving, not virtual stuff. There wouldn't be enough uh, paper in the world to write it on. You would, you, it would be so uh, dense. Because look at the, the formal assumptions that you make, or that, the tons. Yeah, the, the formula assumptions are incredibly simple and they fit the evidence. So again, you want to keep saying they don't fit the evidence. They do fit the evidence. They do produce the effect. Mach gravity works. The only problem with it is this velocity issue, and I've resolved that by pointing out that velocity is something that matter actually has, that material things can capture force and hold it, and therefore keep moving, because they're holding perpetual motion. If you can possess the perpetual motion, then you will have the perpetual motion. Bounce at right angles when they hit a blue ton. The red tons bounce at right angles when they hit a blue ton. Um, and then if they hit, the red, two red tons hit, they bounce. Sometimes they go through each other. Sometimes they bounce 180 degrees. And it all depends. <clears throat> it doesn't matter. As I pointed out, if they're the same color, it doesn't matter whether they go through each other or they reflect the two and consequences of the universe are identical. If they miss each other, they bounce off of each other, or they go through each other. All three universes would be identical after the event. That's why I say it doesn't fucking matter what they do. You, If you want to think they go through each other, go ahead. You want to think they miss each other, go ahead. You want to think they reflect off each other, go ahead. It doesn't matter which one you pick because all three universes, when they're the same color, are identical. For fuck's sake. Depends on what the circumstances are. So if, if it happens that it, it, it's convenient for them to pass through each other, then they do that. If it's convenient that they bounce, they do that. Um, okay, that's just a lie. So I've never said there's no catch where I say it doesn't reflect, it doesn't do this. I said there's hard rules about what happens when red goes into black and when black goes into red. So when one polarization goes into the pole of the opposite polarization, when a, when, a, when a ton of a polarization goes into its opposite um, pole or hits it, it has strict rules about what it's going to do. Uh, strict in the sense that I said it's going to leave perpendicular. Now, which way perpendicular, that gets into a little more complex theory in the sense of it, this, it, which way it goes is decided by what its circumstances are in terms of which way it was uh, previous conditions. So you don't understand that there's previous things that happen to these electrons um, changes their disposition and they'll behave differently based on the fact that whether they ever met a Tyrannosaurus or whether their mother-in-law was a succubus uh, you know different things happen in their life experience and then they have a different attitude when something happens and that different attitude will be revealed then so that's too complex an argument for you that electrons actually have a history that they just don't all the time say I'm exactly the same every single moment no, because they've been bounced around by forces their whole fucking life. They have experience, jackass. And somehow, 
through all of this nonsense uh, when they pass through an electrical field, which, by the way, what the fuck is an electrical field in your theory? Is it is it a bunch of... Uh, there is no, as I pointed out in my theory, electricity is a byproduct. It has not, It isn't a thing. There's no such thing as an electric field. There's no such thing as an electric force. There's movement of electrons being pushed by the quanta, uh, and the only way you can push them is magnetically. You can only push them using charge. Charge is magnetism. They're, they're, the difference between electricity and magnetism, there really isn't one. It's the same force. The electrons and the protons are the magnetic monopoles. <sighs> Dumbass. Electrons that are like, you know, just like standing like, like the Queen's guards standing there making sure the light does what it's supposed to. What the fuck does an electric field look like? In your yeah, again, there is no electric field. There's force bits and there's matter bits. And the only force bits that you can eject are either polarized, the polarization is segregated, or it's not segregated. And if it's segregated and it hits a conductor, it's going to move the electrons. And when it moves the electrons, we call that electricity when they pressurize. Electric pressure, it's voltage. For there to be electricity, there has to be a voltage. The voltage is the difference in potential. That is the difference in pressure. How many electrons? Lots of electrons over here, no electrons over here. It's that negative electron pressure, electron volts. They even use that word in, in, in more deep uh, physics. But that's what it is. It's, it's the electron pressure. For each stupid universe. Now, how does it create uh, the uh, diffraction patterns? And, uh, I mean... <laughs> uh, okay, so now he's back to diffraction patterns. So, yes, I've explained the two slit, and I've said, well, how does it do it? Well, because every time it hits the, an, an electron, it changes its path by 7 degrees. And, let's say, it's whatever the number is. It can be any number, but, I mean, it'll be an explicit number. I'm just saying it's always a multiple of that. So it can go 7 degrees this way, and then the next electron can knock it 7 degrees that way, and so it's back to 0, right? 7, then go 7 back. Or if it hits 2 electrons, it goes 7 and 7, and then it can hit 3 electrons, go 7, 7, 7. That's how you get the pattern. And the pattern isn't just a pattern. The pattern is just a duplication of the image of the slit. That's what the slit pattern is. It's just a multiple image creation because some photons hit two, one electron, some to photons hit two electrons, some photons hit three electrons, some hit photons hit ten electrons. And depending on how many they hit, and that's your probability. And that's why the ones that hit ten is very dim because not too many hit ten, but lots of them hit one. You can't follow that logic. And how, how does it uh, cause uh, polarization in your uh, universe? You've never... Polarization is an effect. It doesn't get caused. Everything is polarized in the sense everything has an orientation. Everything is either square or round. Uh, everything either ha has, has a, a, a vectory position, an alignment. That's just the way it comes. There's, there's, you can't not have it. You're stuck being some kind of polarized. Shithead. Explain how it does that. Uh, other than to say that it just does and it's obvious. But what, what, you, okay, you so I lie. It's just a lie. I've never said it just does and it's obvious. I, I, I'm saying that something is shaped long. If a frisbee is a frisbee and you're throwing them this way or this way, they, you, there's no way to throw them where they aren't polarized. The frisbee itself is polarized. All you can do is change which way it's polarized. You can't understand that? You don't create polarization. Mathematic formulas you would have to apply to these little objects. You know, because you would have to make these, these formulas explicit at some point. And you'd have to say, well, this is what happens when this is exact... The, the formulas are explicit. The inverse square law is explicit. The idea that it matters how far away a target is to how much divergence happens is explicit. Uh, you know, lots of the, 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 the mathematics isn't going to improve this any, except um, in the sense that some of the math should get a lot simpler. I don't think Einstein's equations need to be quite so complicated. 
I mean, it is more complicated just in the sense that it's you're dealing with polarization that is not segregated. And so you have probabilities between um, how much reflection pressure there's going to be in a circumstance where there's no segregation. So you have to have some way to measure a kind of um, randomized volume. You know, so, so, but that, that, that math is, again, that's just probability math, so it shouldn't be too difficult. The trajectory of this photon, and then it hits the electric field, and then it bounces at this exact degree somehow that makes it look like it's a wave. Or, um, in the case of the polar polarization experiment, uh, it passes through one of these, and then the one that's diagonal twists all these tons, even though these tons are orders of magnitude smaller than the grid itself, right? The, 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 and, and you're saying orders of magnitude smaller, but the whole idea of the polarizing film working is the very fact that it does have very close lines, lots and lots of them. So to say that it doesn't matter and that that doesn't have an effect, I think is just garbage. I think clearly the electrons have to line up between the, um, the, the atoms that are in rows and the alignment of those electrons will have to have the same symmetry that everything else has to follow. They're going to have to obey the rigid lines. The lines are going to dictate that they are perpendicular to them. And their perpendicularity is going to make sure that anything that comes in off perpendicular is going to be forced to go perpendicular. Perpendicular is a, a key concept in physics. I don't know if you realize that. But even your own electric and magnetic fields somehow are perfectly perpendicular to each other. Have you ever explained why they're perfectly per perpendicular? How did they know how to be perfectly perpendicular? How did they figure that out? How did your fucking fields, your two ether fields, figure out how to go perpendicular? I mean, this argument that somehow I have to explain why things are uh, uh, per perpendicular sensitive, why the universe has that feature, and yet you don't have to. You can just say, well, that's the way it is. And it's, that's a, a, a satisfactory answer. You have no explanation for why your electric field is perpendicular to your magnetic field. You have zero explanation for why it knows how to do that. And yet you claim other people have to explain it. You're, you're duplicity. You're just such a duplicitous, dishonest fuck. Space between the, the, the lines, the polarization lines. Uh, somehow the electric field in between the lines causes the photons to twist this way. How does it do that? Uh, well, I gave analogies to it. It could be something as structurally simple as the analogy of throwing frisbees through jail bars and how some of the frisbees don't have to be perfectly straight to still get through the bars. That's sort of an analogy. And then as I just pointed out, if the electrons are what's really going to sit there, they're going to hit an electron, are, uh, the, and the electrons have their perpendicular orientation to the two bars, they're not going to line up. The electrons aren't going to you never there's no evidence that electric fields or magnetic fields established or charge fields between two charged plates it's pretty clear their lines of force are perpendicular to the surfaces idiot i didn't make that rule that's your rule and it's a perfectly valid rule that's the way it is that's the way the evidence indicates the truth is so the electrons are lining up perpendicularly they're going to try to. They're going to force things that aren't perpendicular to be perpendicular. Fuck. Well, is there a map? So you have to find a mathematical formula that explains why, in this particular instance, they twist like this, and then why, when uh, you need to create gravity and you have two bodies like this. So, so, so this is a question. He doesn't. His theory doesn't even go anywhere close to answering it. We know this is what polarization is doing. He's somehow claiming, I guess, that polarizing filters aren't changing the polarization of the light. Even though that seems the only reasonable answer to how the fuck the third filter could possibly work is that obviously it's changing the polarization of the light so now the light can get through the bar. So you know, it's like me taking jail bars and moving them this way. Now if I move them a little bit at a time I can get many more frisbees to be able to get through the bars. Photon, the tons or the tons bounce perpendicular where they bounce 180 degrees to create a gravitational force. But then when it's moving through space and it's being bombarded with other tons, 
doing more charge going this way than doing this way. Yeah, okay, so well, I've already done this argument, okay? Uh, clearly the the square or red or I mean square or round or red or black tons do not interact in free space. So yes, the black ones maybe hit the black ones, the red ones maybe hit the red ones, and all those interactions will be invisible. As I pointed out, all the kinetic interactions are just invisible. You, if they miss each other, the same universe. If they hit each other, the same universe. If they go through each other, the same universe. So those interactions are pointless. And my argument is, is the matter bit is what allows black force to interact with red force. So it's the red force and the black force that in free space can't interact. Dumbass. Fucking liar. I've said this. I've been over this. You just keep lying about what my theory says. You don't quote it. You just lie about it. Okay. okay. That's just a mathematical fact. Not only would you encounter more in this direction, you'd, you'd actually be going faster in this direction relative to the object. So uh, again, uh, kinetics of uh, this matter, where everything's going the same speed, it's not possible for anything to go faster. Nothing goes slower. Nothing goes faster. They're pure kinetic interactions. No friction. No losses. No little bits fly off. None of that bullshit. So just lie some more about the theory. We'll be encountering a great deal of force this way. Oh, except uh, mathematically, you have to find some function that, that if it, as long as as long as it encounters something going faster than you know what it would be stationary, that that means that the ton knows to bounce to to not apply force to the object and instead to become a part of the object and help it along as it. Because, because these times are forcing. No, no, they're just telling. That if I if I stick ten things together and then I poke something in, it can knock one of the ten out. So it replaces one going this way with one going that way. So again, this argument that I haven't somehow explained that too. I have explained that. Electrons aren't just nothing. They they can they have this buffering capacity. They're a buffer. They contain a certain number of all this stuff and it can make exchanges and buffer reactions. I, I, you know, I, if not, then they would be moving the speed of light all the time too because then every single time they got hit with a ton they would automatically be going the speed of light and they're obviously not doing that. And they obviously do have a mass greater than the, the force bit. So let's, let's not pretend the evidence doesn't indicate that electrons and protons are a lot bigger than uh, photons. Single photon. The wrong way tons to fly right for a minute, and you have to you have to make up a mathematical function for why that happens. And at the end of all this, you have you know, so much data and so many uh, you know exceptions. It would be like a giant. You know, but whatever. So all this talk about stuff that isn't in the theory and stuff that isn't a consequence of the theory. So he's just saying somehow that's way too complicated. Uh, you know, right turn, left turn, but you know, square geometry, way too complicated. No, no, I'm afraid it's not. I guess it's just, um, it's, it's, it, again, the, the only argument that makes any sense is that somehow you're afraid of the universe boiling down to simpler processes at the origin. You're going to try to make a god out of something here, and you can't make a god out of a force bit. Computer code uh, that, you know, you would, would be, uh, the entropy of it would be as great as uh, just, a, just a description of the universe without any uh, physical laws, just, just an arbitrary description of the universe. Uh, again, so he recites some of the laws, like the right turn law, the blues are different than the reds, the polarization laws. So there's plenty of laws, and he just says, no, there's none. No, there's like five. There's five pretty good rules, and that's the nature of the game, and it's a checkerboard. And with five rules, <coughs> two different colored checkers, uh, you can make a pretty complex pattern with just random events, uh, random quote unquote. Uh, without, you know, condensing that description into an application of some physical laws that are applied over and over again. And that just seems like the exact opposite of what uh, physical theory is. So, so again, he just paraphrased my theory as saying it doesn't have any laws in it, and then he just complained a minute ago about the laws. Uh, how is this a rational argument? It's, it's, it's insane. Supposed to do, uh, which is to do the opposite to make uh, the physical description of the universe simpler, to compress it uh, the code into something that can be written as an equation. Um, yes, the inverse square law is all the equation you need to describe the 
uh, how force emanates from spherically even pressure. And the argument is is that the universe is applying, uh, generally speaking, spherically even pressure, and that in where you create these matter bits, you create filters for that pressure. You divert it by rules of this right turn thing. Um, and, and the fact that now two forces can interact and ex because they're different colors now. The force of one color can interact with the force of the other color and that can't happen in free space. And so now you have all kinds of path changes and the key critical path change, I've been over it and over it, is you create the square. The four right turns that create a circular path that traps the energy. And all of chemistry, all of physics is just is just overtly full of the idea of trapping energy and then releasing energy. That's what a nuclear bomb demonstrates. That's what all of that's what uh, you know friction, heat demonstrate. Everything demonstrates. There's a ton of energy trapped, and when you disrupt and break the patterns, you release the energy. How is that some sort of? Oh, that's insanely complicated. How could the universe work like that? Energy traps and then the stuff gets broken, the trap breaks and the energy is released. That's insanely complicated. No. Yes, so again, you have absolutely no, you know, there's, there's no uh, indication that you care about this idea, or that you care that if you actually did try to apply an mathematical formula to your theory, it would look uh, crazy. Uh, as I've stated over and over again, uh, uh, Newton's formulas are fine, uh, you know, not specific enough, but fine. Uh, I'm perfectly happy with all of Maxwell's equations, uh, generally speaking. It basically points out how it's conservational and it has perpendicular all over the place, which, yes, that's exactly how I see it too, Mr. Maxwell. Um, well, here's another uh, argument. The, the two slit and the one slit are both modeled by the same equation, which is the Huygens principle. Okay, and you pretend that okay, and it, okay. So let's let's explain the differences. The difference is is the math for the two slit experiment uh, is the, the 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 variable key to the math is changed from the width of the slit to the width of the impediment, and the slits aren't even in the math. The width of the slits not even in the math. No variable for that. Um, second, they change the numbering of the pattern. So in the single slit, they have a zero where the you know the the first um, brightnesses okay it's called zero and then the other brightnesses are called one two three four on either side and then in the double slit all of a sudden no we're not counting brightnesses we're counting deficits okay so we have we have zero and then one for the deficits there is no zero really there's just one deficit on the on the sides so one two three zero is gone all of a sudden so you rig and change and manipulate to make the math work, but it doesn't really work. It's not the same equation when you've changed the variables. How can you say it's the same equation when in one thing the variable is the open space and the other one the variable is the closed space? They're exactly opposite. In one, the, the number pattern is the, um, where there is no light, and in the other one it is where there is light. Exactly the opposite. You can't say it's the same equation being applied. This isn't true. But again, this is uh, not a matter of opinion. This is not something that can be decided by you know, your uh, opinion. It is a fact, and you can look it up. And the fact that the okay, so again, he's, he's declared facts. He's declared the, the subject's closed. We've nailed in the coffin because we've rigged the math, you know, played this preposterous game where in the single slit, okay, we Huygens legitimately... We, <laughs> which creates two photons uh, separated by half the distance of the slit, and in the double slit, no, we say it's point sources. Okay, <laughs> there, there's no two photons created by the slit. No, there's, it's just a point source, and it radiates a wave coming out of it. So if you applied the same point source rule to the single slit, then you'd only have one wave, and you wouldn't have any hope of getting any uh, interference pattern. And in fact, there isn't any interference pattern in water waves. So in water waves, there's no evidence that there's any similarity between your silly 
contrived nonsensical assumption. And so this is his nail in the coffin. Again, he's saying we've declared it the truth based on our volume of evidence and they have shit for evidence. And they're just going to keep claiming it's great evidence when it's absolute shit. Yeah, well, why don't you take that up with them? <laughs> no, well, I have taken it up with them and they ignore it. They don't they, they pretend it's not true. Uh, you know, they don't have any obligation to answer my critiques. But I'm sure if I get in the real argument, if I get a real physicist and ask him these real questions, he's going to kind of, he's going to have a vac vacuous answer. Well, uh, you know, I don't know why uh, the, the why it doesn't uh, you know the the the, <coughs> the image in photons doesn't obey the mathematical rules. I guess those photons didn't go to fucking uh, uh, college, and they don't know they're supposed to obey this w wave rule. And so instead, they're duplicating the pattern of the slit, and they don't know that they're not supposed to be duplicating the pattern of the slit. They're supposed to be waving. Each the extremely long wave, which doesn't have any closed form solutions. Again, you don't have a, you don't have an answer for the simplest part. When when the, when the image is diverging, explain why it goes to a focus at the edges. Why does it go to a focus at the edges? It's not, there's no math saying it does that. There's no math that says it does this eyeball shape thing. Why don't you explain why it does that? Um, but you know what, you can't, you can't actually assume that the points, that the, uh, the slits are point sources, because if they're, if they're arbitrarily small relative to the gap between them, then they do behave like point sources. <laughs> well, again, this whole argument that somehow we can do this preposterous averaging thing and we haven't destroyed the basic mechanism. No, you can't make them point sources. I, you, you know, you're not recognizing the fact that the complexity is deeper than that, that these are really tiny little photons interacting with big giant electrons. And you're just going to pretend it doesn't really happen that way by saying, I'm just going to call it a point source. Well, it's not just a point source, shithead. There are real photons going in real positions in the slit. Some of them go next to the slit, I mean the material. Some of them go right next to it. Some go right through the middle. You're just pretending, no, it doesn't matter where they go. Anywhere they go, they're going to fly in some kind of wacky probabilistic way. And it doesn't matter where they go through the middle. It doesn't matter where they go right through the edge. That, that Those two atmospheres are exactly the same in your fucking wacky book. And I'm still calling it just that. To me, that's an insanely insipid conclusion to draw that it doesn't matter how close fucking photons travel to charged surfaces. And there are always charges, as I've already pointed out. You can't avoid a surface being charged. It can be weakly charged, but it's always going to be charged, negative or positive. It just can't help itself. Right. Uh, so it's not really, it's not like the professors are lying about the formula. They're just, you know, they're just making it simple. They're, they're reducing the complexity of it. But the actual map itself does exist, and you've had it shown to you. Uh, again, as he says they, he's, they've shown me the math with the right assumptions, and it was on a form board and three pages long. Okay, so, and he says that's the truth. So, no physics lecture, not MIT, not Yale, not any fucking college can actually produce this right math. No fucking documentary produces it. No video on the entire YouTubes on the subject of two slits produces this math. No mathematician, who I actually am subscribed to, mathematicians, um, can do the, to do the math that way. And yet he says there's the right math. That page proves it. And yet, the math is never done. They don't prove it by saying, look, here's the experiment and here's our mathematical results. Our formula came up with the right answer. There's no evidence that they came up with the right answer. There's no fucking test of the fucking math. None. There's just a little end statement. See, we reduced it to, you know, 4 pi w squared w delta phi phi phi. There. Doesn't that prove it works? No, that doesn't prove shit. <coughs> Uh, it just they're just amazing. So he's saying he knows for sure that in that math they just didn't turn into point sources. Or in that math um, they didn't eventually just eliminate the meaning of the two, the width of the slits. Again, if I gave them the the, the actual experimental results, could their math duplicate them? Where was the evidence that their math duplicated actual results? Where? Where is the evidence the math works on that page? Where's the evidence that formula works? And you pretend that it doesn't exist. And this is a matter of fact. This is a factual... This is, 
<laughs> yeah, what's factual is you're claiming without any evidence that it works, that it works. You're claiming to know it works. You're claiming to know they didn't do some chicanery in those three pages of derivatives, that there wasn't some chicanery where they just turned it back into point sources and allowed to have spherical ray, rays coming off of their single point source. You don't know whether they did that in that math or not, yet you're claiming to know for sure they didn't. I mean, you're just, you're such a dishonest sack of shit. Contention related to fact. And you know, like any contention related to fact, you can look up the correct answer with Google. You yeah, show me. Show me the correct answer. Show me how I look up the correct answer on Google and there's some evidence. Show me the Google reference that demonstrates where they tested the LIGO interferometer. They moved matter in the way of the beam, you know, in proximity to the beam, and they demonstrated how they shifted the light with the moving matter. Show me. Show me the evidence. Show me how I can just Google it and get the evidence. Not some declaration, not some, we did it. Uh, yeah, but there's lots of videos of people going, we did it. There's not too much video demonstrating how they did it or proving that they did it. Why don't you show me some fucking evidence that they did it? Google it. Um, here's another argument. Have you ever seen a ton? How do you know they exist? You've never seen them, okay? You've never seen... Yeah, I've never seen a proton, an electron. I've never even seen an atom, frankly. You know, realistically, a discrete atom. You know, not blended into a bunch of others. Never seen it. So what does that mean? That we, we, can't, we can't create instruments that can detect it? I've never heard uh, high frequencies. I, you know, I've never done lots of things, but I know they exist because we can create tools that can separate them and identify them. And Einstein separated photons a long time ago and demonstrated there's rules about how they hit matter and that the rules are Call, call, cause of quantization, that they represent a corpuscular nature to this energy, that it doesn't spread, it doesn't do any of this shit, it's the tiniest of influences that we can detect. In space, but you've also never seen a ton. Okay, so if you're, if you're going to say, well, nothing in the universe not behave like that speech because you've never seen it. We've well, never seen a ton. Okay, so again, he's saying because uh, the ton word, so anything that has ton on the end of it, photon, electron, proton, we don't know they can, they don't exist by his definition because we haven't personally seen one. So none of our experiments are valid. None of the evidence produced is valid. Um, so he claims that he's going to use this is this, you know, I, I mean, you see the duplicity. Clearly, he's dependent, completely dependent on all these experiments proving something, except for the ones that prove the existence of times. They're bullshit. Isn't that convenient? Okay. You don't know that they exist. Uh, another argument. Your theory has no use, even if it's true. Okay, it's not? Uh, I, I mean, clearly, <laughs> um, I'm not going to get to the use argument, but charge demonstrates the validity of making these arguments about these force bits. Clearly the fact that my theory unifies physics and explains phenomenon your theories can't explain is a huge plus for my side, jackass. Okay, so now he says, even if my theory is correct, he knows it has no implications. That it can't possibly lead to a better understanding our physics um, better, uh, be being more capable of mani manipulating matter and energy. He knows that already, because he went to the future and found out. It's impossible to prove it or disprove it, and that is, by definition, God theory. That, by definition, uh, again, it, the proof is in the evidence, and the evidence is first it unifies physics, and it does so with a simpler model, a less complex model. Two big pluses right there. And the other evidence is in the material facts of Maxwell's equations and it being perfectly compatible with that, how it does create a perfect inverse square law rule. Uh, so there's lots of evidence. For you to claim there's no evidence is idiotic. It can be logically proven. Darwin's bird beaks and Darwin's turtle shells do not just by themselves prove anything. You have to sit there and put them into context and say, look, there's no probability that these beaks would be changing in these subtle amounts, in these 
you know, by these tiny incremental proportions by random chance. That's like expecting 10 Yahtzee dice to stack up on top of each other. It couldn't possibly happen by just random chance. It can't be just random chance that my theory fits all of these um, factual, um, narrow constraints. The fact that it works and it actually explains all of these other phenomena demonstrates that there's no probabilistic, realistic expectation that something wrong could have all of those right answers. Dumbo. That's called evidence, dumb shit. That's called logic being applied, retard. The fact that uh, by virtue of your not being able to ha uh, prove it or disprove it makes it a God theory. Okay. <clears throat> Another okay, so I'm just saying that one you just be thrown right back in your face and say nothing that you propose, none of the physics proposed by you can be anything but a God theory because you haven't produced any hard evidence. You have no videotapes of the uh, atom, no videotapes of electrons, protons, neutrons, no, certainly no videotapes of uh, neutrinos. Uh, our antiparticles, our dark space, our dark matter, clearly all things not even close to evidentially demonstrate with anything uh, logical, except the fact that it seems quite logical that they're merely contrivances to fix errors in math. The math isn't working. We need something to fix it. Dark matter was not. Do you, you really? Are you are, are you going to honestly say to me that you think physics would have invented dark matter if their math worked? If they didn't have mathematical problems that necessitated the existence of dark matter? It's your theory they would have believed dark matter existed even if the math didn't uh, necessitate a fix. If the math worked fine, they still would have uh, invented dark matter. I think you understand that that wouldn't be true. Which display Huygens principle. Uh, you have seen videos of water waves behaving exactly like the single and double, and double slit uh, pattern. Okay, just a lie. Uh, okay, it's just a lie. So especially Puro's fake evidence. So he now he's defending fake evidence. So I create diffracted waves. That is, I create very erratic, um, multi-frequency waves, and then I put them through a slit, and I say that's the same as doing the experiment with consistent, straight, flat waves. So I create a bunch of turbulence, and I shove that through a slit, and that's the same as doing the experiment with nice, straight, flat waves. That's an honest experiment. That's how waves work. So, you know, preposterous liar. If you do the experiment honestly, and you put nice flat waves into a single split in, slit in water, you won't get any diffraction pattern. Just at the tiniest little edges, and that's only because of the friction of the water with the material of the slit. And it, it'll be, in, it, it'll have nothing to do with any kind of mathematical interference pattern. There won't be any mathematical interference pattern. The math won't give you the pattern, because it won't exist. And you pretend that uh, you, you, you uh, have a great deal of cognitive dissonance whenever the subject is brought up. Uh, here's another argument. Okay, so I'm just saying, it can't get more preposterous than that. They have fake evidence, I recognize it as fake evidence, I explain why it's fake evidence, and then he says, I have cognitive dissonance because I don't sit there and eat fake evidence. General relativity explains more phenomenon in a coherent theory. The other theory makes use of uh, again, just a big bold claim. Oh, quantum mechanics is the most uh, fantastical math ever in the history of mankind. Created everything in the universe. <clears throat> just bullshit claims. Again, uh, uh, relativity theory. The proof for it is lensing, which, uh, as I've pointed out, is incredibly weak evidence just incredibly weak and com full of rife with all kinds of paradoxical problems that you can't explain. So it doesn't look too good as a piece of evidence. The procession of Mercury explained merely by understanding that the Sun is processing and anything close to the Sun while it's processing is going to feel the procession. The further away you go, the less the procession of the Sun could possibly matter to the gravitational equation. The closer you are, the more the procession of the sun matters. can be perfectly explained. You don't need to bend space. You don't need to bend time. Not necessary to understand, oh, okay, Newton didn't really understand that the sun was processing. The center of the sun's gravity was processing. 
talk excuses. Okay, your your theory makes use of the tons tip and tap at right angles, and the clocks get broken when they travel too fast, and the dancing electrons, and the tons going the right way. All right, yeah, so, so it's preposterous to think that when you um, accelerate or give matter velocity <clears throat> that you've changed the force inside the matter. That's a silly theory, in his opinion, that you've trapped it in circles that are processing just like the sun. And that procession means a movement in a direction. We force the tons going the wrong way to fly right. And the tons going the wrong way bounce and become a part of the matter going the right way. And the nickels and morley uh, interferometers diffracting the light. Well, even a, a Michelson morley No, it's not even diffracting the light. First, it's not using light that's in phase. Second, it's not using a source of light that's monochromatic, so it can't possibly be in phase. <laughs> you know, um, and uh, the argument is, and third, it's detecting vibrations in the mirrors, not any expansion of distance. Well, this has nothing to discredit the experiment since the pattern still changes as a function of distance. And by okay, I'm going to argue that it's not anything to do with distance. It just has to do with moving a mirror. And obviously, when you move a mirror, you change the distance because when you move it this way, this side's closer. When you move it this way, this side's closer. Duh. Duh. Extension we would expect it to change if light traveled with respect to a fixed reference point. It was designed to test the existence of an ether, but it also disproves your theory because of the math that you ignore. Okay, again, there is no math with the interferometer, so that's just a lie. Um, and uh, frankly, again, you haven't proven it. You're, you haven't even tested your instrument. You're claiming the instrument works. You never tested it, never proved it. You just claim it. That's And that's good science. Good science is don't test. Don't demonstrate with evidence, just make claims. Here's another argument. If speed was a sum of a finite number of particles going the same direction, then speed would be a discrete measurement. Okay, because it would be a, a, a sum of a finite number of particles. Yes, that's exactly what it is. And in every finite Planck measure of time, the constituent of those particle arrangements is changing. So a million or a billion times per second, each one of my atoms is changing its a direct uh, momentum. Its momentum is changing a billion times a second. Yeah. Uh, but so far the interferometer experiments that have been conducted uh, show that space-time and by implication time is continuous. Uh, uh, no proof. I mean, I don't know where you get that from. Proven. Again, proof based on what? Proof based on we <laughs> claim a result that matches the pattern we were looking for because there's a billion patterns, and of course, one of our pattern happens to be one of those billions of patterns. <laughs> yeah, I found the number three in a in a pile of seven million numbers. Wow, what a surprise! I found the number three. So again, in order to elaborate on this argument, it would require an explanation of the differences between discrete and continuous spaces. Something that you, uh, being intellectually uh, a closed-minded would, would not... Again, so who's closed-minded? He's the one saying, we nailed the coffin shut, we've closed the, the subject, we have all the evidence we need, we don't accept any conversation about anything, because none of this is doubtable, or, or none of it's on based on weak evidence, or preposterous exaggerations, or invention of fake forces. No, 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 it's all legitimate shit. Even though Suskind, one of your little popes, will even admit that his anti-particles are really just vacuations in space, where there was a particle, it left, it left a hole, the hole is the anti. Oh yeah, that's that makes a lot of sense. Would, would you tune out, and it would be pointless to bring it up. Oh, uh, here's another argument. What holds matter together? You say it is tons uh, getting into orbits. In a square orbit. uh, no, I never said that, so again, lie. Lie some more. I made the metaphor and said, no, I don't think they're doing this orbiting thing. The 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 photon, the, the electrons and the protons aren't doing all this a huge amount of moving. They're positions, like magnets and positions. And all those positions are under tension. I used the example that if I put a bunch of magnets of all the same face, uh, they'll, they'll repel each other. And if I can create some mechanism that forces that repulsion into a uh, always to be in tension, that is, puts pressure on that repulsion, that no matter where I move something, I'm going to move every single other magnet to some degree. The force will be spread evenly over all of them. I said, that's how atoms are. Uh, but then they must mount perpendicular the same direction every time. Why is that? Okay, so... 
Well, well, again, I've explained that, and it is a little more complicated because it has to do with the previous condition of the electron. So it depends on the force. It's obviously in an atom, two atoms are next to each other. There's going to be places where there's very high pressure um, from different angles. You know, there's going to be different abilities to change the pressure, where the pressure is going to go. There's going to be a weak link and strong links, and it's going to go where the weak link is. Yeah. But it's a little complicated to explain weak link. But weak link's going to have to do with how much density, how far away the atom is from, say, the surface of the material. Or, you know, lots of equations to decide which direction is going to be the weak link. But you can't understand that the surface material stuff probably has stronger bonds than the stuff on the inside. You can't think that, oh yeah, that probably makes some fucking sense. On, you know, bounce perpendicular this time, and then by the time it goes around again, you might bounce perpendicular this way or this way. Why is it always the same direction? <clears throat> it uh, may not be always the same direction. The point is, is that when you add it up over a billion atoms inside of a substance, that nothing can ever escape very far. So the rule is that it can go in lots of crooked directions, but the tendency, because it's inside the matter, the collective, that all the paths are going to end up circular. Um, now, I mean, if your argument is that uh, uh, the inverse square law is just an instance of, lar of the principle of large numbers, um, you know, you, 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 now, that's not what I argue. I never even would say anything so fucking silly. It has nothing to do with any fucking principle of large numbers. It has to do with divergence. The, it's, the force is going to get weaker because the force is diverging. Yes, it's a particulate force. If I explode ten little balls that are next to each other and I explode them evenly into space, they are automatically diverging by the inverse square law. Their distance away from each other is doing exactly what the inverse square law dictates. That's, that means it's going based on this the curve of, of exponentiality. It wouldn't make sense for a particle to always bounce one way. It would, it would bounce randomly. Um, but uh, by There is no real random, so again, that word doesn't mean anything either. There's no real uh, random, and I'm certainly going to argue that the geometry of atoms is not random. The geometry is very precise and rigid, and that's why you can have diamonds and graphite. Two completely different, uh, same exact atoms, but because of how they're arranged, they have a completely different uh, properties expressed. And it's not because they're doing something random or sloppy, it's because there's rigid rules about how they connect. Admitting that it has to always bounce in the exact same direction each time uh, is no longer just an instance of lar the large number principle, uh, but it's rather a, an instance of some arbitrary ad hoc excuse where, where now again, there's no arbitrary ad hoc excuse. My argument is is that the fact is that each atom is in a different circumstance. The surface atom is different than the atom in this. The atom in the center of the Earth is different than an atom on the surface of the Earth. The one in the center is under huge pressure and in, in, uh, surviving huge temperatures. It's a different environment. So yes, I'm claiming that all material objects create those kinds of difference in environment, and that is that whenever anything starts to go towards the surface, it's not going to be able to do it in a straight line. It doesn't matter whether it curves this way or curves that way as it's heading for a flat surface. The point is, is that it does that on each surface, inevitably over time, it's always going to end up back in the center again. It might take a very long path to get there, but it's always going to end up back in the starting point, and it's going to do the same thing again and end up back in the middle. You can't understand. You're too stupid. You you have you have very uh, meager uh, uh, imagination and cognitive skills. You you can't get that things aren't like pieces of bread or something. Physics doesn't work that way. It's not the same throughout the whole loaf of bread. Critical is arbitrarily defined to do one thing, and there's no reason for it to do that other than it's convenient. Um, and how is that different than... So again, it's, there's no argument out of convenience. There's argument out of the necessity that clearly the center of the Earth is different than the surface of the Earth. And something, <coughs> uh, a construct like string theory. You know, it, it, it's not simpler. It's not, it doesn't rely on uh, statistics any more than something like string theory does. 
because you've uh, defined a particle that behaves arbitrarily in a very... Again, it's the simplest um, mechanism that you could imagine. So it has none of the complexity of a string. It doesn't have any... There's no necessity for a complex mechanical structure. There's just two polarizations, uh, and it always moves the same speed, and it doesn't change direction until it hits a material bit. Now, you can't get any simpler than that as a, as a blueprint of function. I would claim there's no simpler definition that could possibly create the complexity. This simple description can create the, the complexity that exists. The simple rule that it does take these right turns means you can create the traps, and the traps make all kinds of complexity possible. In a really specific way. Um, and it's no longer uh, an instance of the large number principle, but it's a function of particles that behave in no way, shape, or form like anything you've ever seen. So again, what's the advantage of your theory? So again, just a lie. I mean, we have seen pool balls. We've seen lots of things, and we've seen them obey certain rules. And all I'm saying is the rule here is, like I said, that these things are shaped a certain way, so this is how they interact. All right? And that's it. But it's not that complicated. They're not pool balls. Yeah, there's something that, you know, either goes, either reflects or it goes perpendicular. That's the rule. But it's not a complex rule, and it's not an unimaginable rule. Like, again, all i got to do is make them arrow-shaped, and you can understand how the two things, when they hit each other, they're either going to go this way or it's going to go that way. I mean, there's ways of illustrating the simplicity of a rule and why something would behave the way it behaves. Things do it for simple mechanical reasons. There's a simple mechanical reason. Now, you want a videotape of it. I don't have the videotape. You don't have videotapes of electrons, protons, neutrons, muons. You don't have any fucking uh, diagram of these things. You don't have any of their geometry written down. So, again, just, just, just be a complete asshole and say somehow I have to come up with this videotape that you don't have to produce. Over any other theory that explains more observations. Um, here's some other arguments. Uh, you don't understand geometry. You don't understand the Pythagorean theorem. You don't understand how, you can, how it's possible to throw balls out of trains. Because you're an idiot. Okay, you okay, well, I'm not going to argue the fact that photons aren't throwing a baseball out of a train. That's exactly my argument. Photons can't carry two momentums. They can't convert momentums into a new speed or new distance. Uh, a baseball can. A baseball can acquire a new speed. I can change. I can give it. I can give it two momentums, and it will come up with a new speed. That's neither one of the. <coughs> that's not an addition of the two other speeds, but is actually the uh, precise um, um, combining of the two speeds, um, you know, obeying, um, you know, the rules of um, um, angular momentum. I understand algebra, you say stupid shit, like, why don't you use real numbers? Well, you know, if you understood algebra, you'd know it doesn't matter. You could, anytime you plug in numbers, you would get the correct answer. And you really think that scientists are, are so inept that they have I don't even know what that means. You can plug in any kind of... Your, we can make numbers out of squiggly squiggly. I can make up any kind of number. Squiggly squiggly point squiggly squiggly. Tested every single one of their, uh, you know, um, their, 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 their equations with data. Okay, they, 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 they have tested all of them. They have plugged in real numbers every single time. Okay, I'm just saying, obviously they didn't test the, the two slit in terms of why it doesn't do the perfectly symmetrical wave. There's lots, I can just keep pointing out all these tests. Uh, where, where's your, your test of the interferometer uh, detecting gravity? Um, and uh, here's some examples, okay, they've measured time. Uh, with muon decay and uh, you know with, with satellites and you claim yes uh, and I claim a perfectly rational reason for why muons when you accelerate them decay slower so I, I provide a completely rational explanation why decay rates of matter changes when you uh, impose velocity but this is a clock breaking uh, you know, but you have to admit that, that GR is consistent with reality even even if you're right and it's actually the clock breaking General relativity is still consistent with... I, I didn't say. I, I said overtly that Einstein's contrivance of this theory was a brilliant piece of work because he actually did make it match what kind of physical evidence we had access to. And even Huygens, you could argue, even it is a brilliant piece of, of creation in the sense that it works as long as we did, aren't able to see. As long as our vision stays blurry, you can invent this fake wavy crap. 
Heisenberg, the same rule applies that, okay, it's an explanation because we don't have the capacity to prove it to be just a nonsense. So, but I've always said this in videos. I said Einstein's theory is a, is a brilliant pile of crap. But the fact is, it doesn't unify. The fact is, it does create paradoxes. The fact is, it doesn't perfectly answer the questions. And my argument to you is, my theory does so much more than Einstein's theory and has so many fewer liabilities. So I'm just saying, by a rational comparison of these two, if you took these two theories into, a, into an honest jury who wasn't prejudiced like you, okay, so you didn't know that this was the popular one, or this was Einstein's one, this was Dopey Gary's theory. If there was an honest evaluation of these two explanations, I'm saying I would win by a long shot because I explain things that are really interesting, like how magnets attract, and Einstein didn't have a fucking clue. Okay, I explain why a nuclear bomb creates so much energy because of the strong nuclear force, and Einstein didn't have a fucking clue. The results. Um, another argument. It is not possible for classical particles, Gary particles, or any type of particles to create a diffraction pattern. Your assumptions are that photons travel. Uh, again, there's no point in arguing this. Uh, the, 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 the fact that they are to create a divergence, to change the um, direction that the photon is traveling, is perfectly within the bounds of what uh, material objects are capable of doing. Okay, in all kinds of circumstances, like rainbows and all kinds of places, there's a purely mechanical, reflective explanation works just fine. You don't need wave theory to explain rainbows. You explain it by having the number of reflections inside of the fucking water, um, uh, uh, the spherical water droplet. And they're clear reflections, clear geometry. No fucking waves necessary. <clears throat> Straight line until they encounter another thing. Oh, but they can interact with photons. Oh, but they can inter interact with electrons. So the you know, electrons somehow make the particles behave like a wave. Uh, again, they don't behave like a wave. You say they behave like a wave. I don't say they behave anything like a wave. I say they're discrete objects. You're saying if I shoot a gun, bang, 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 I create a wave. I'm saying, no, there's no fucking wave there. There's not anything close to a wave. You're an idiot to call that a wave. Okay, it's a period. It's billets uh, separated by distance. There's no wave anywhere. There's a frequency of bullets. And this property is something that is not deduced by the formal assumptions that atoms happen on perpendicular. Okay, if it did, you would still expect a classical particle pattern, uh, but you'd expect it to be wider because they're bouncing perpendicular. Yeah, there's no point, right? There's no, <coughs> there's no point. They're bouncing perpendicular from an electron that's moving. So again, just ignore the theory. The theory isn't like, oh yeah, the photon, the photons hit the electrons and always go perpendicular because the electron never spins or never turns or never moves. The whole argument I made was the electron does move. That's why light travels slower through mediums. It's because it takes time to bounce off of electrons, but to, to move through electrons, to move the force through the patterns of the arrangement of the electrons. The arrangement of the electrons changes how the force moves, so it doesn't move in a straight line. So I bet if you could make the two-slit experiment really deep, really long, if that was theoretically possible, you could actually slow light down. If you could create enough interactions, it would actually slow the light down. Clearly, sometimes. Uh, it would not be an on-off pattern. By the way, why an on-off pattern? Why is that something you would expect to see in nature? What is being turned on and off, idiot? It's the simplest pattern was my only argument, that you, every time you see the simplest pattern nature, nature can possibly create, you shouldn't assume it's created by the same force, because obviously the simplest thing could be created by many things. That would be the logical deduction. And what I'm arguing is it's not an on-off pattern technically, it's a duplication of the same pattern over and over and over again, merely because you've You've hit more electrons. Uh, here's another argument. The only reason you always win arguments is because every word gets three in response from you. So you can take things out of context. All right, so you can say something like, we've proven that interferometers can measure gravity waves. And my response should just be, no, uh I shouldn't explain how your proof is vacuous, how you really haven't produced any evidence, how you haven't tested the instrument. So every time you make a claim about the two slit proves waves, or you say something really idiotic like, we've shown you hard evidence of water waves in a single slit creating diffraction patterns. 
Wait, it's a complete lie, right? I know, you're gonna have to wait a minute, buddy. Yeah, it's almost done. ...by pausing the video incessantly, hoping the audience forgets what was being discussed. Also, the other people cannot refute your straw man bullshit in replying. Okay, okay, so it's, I don't even know, you know, maybe I'll play this when I do a comment video the last end of it. But, I mean, this accusation is somehow, I mean, I've been fair copped you. I've given you your fucking opportunity. I played your fucking goddamn video, and you fucking cunts are still so fucking lame, you're saying, That's unfair to me! You played my exact quote! You responded, everybody could see if you tried to cheat some way, or you tried to manipulate what somebody says. No, I didn't manipulate anything you said. You made direct accusations, and I responded to your direct accusations. You motherfucking lying cunt! You can't be any more dickless than this! Can you possibly have smaller goddamn nuts to sit there and whine that I've somehow treated you unfairly, you motherfucking lying piece of shit! I mean, I waste my goddamn time responding to your motherfucking goddamn video, and then you complain that my explanation is actually an explanation, that I actually go into the details of why you're full of shit! Instead of just saying, uh uh, you lying piece of fuck! Uh-uh, you lying piece of fuck! I can do that over and over again, you ugly, smelly sack of shit! I mean, I can't believe there are fucking men on this goddamn earth who sit there call themselves John fucking goddamn Wayne and they have no penis, no balls! They're such fucking faggots, they can't sit there and stand up and make a goddamn argument. Instead, they're gonna wimp out and say, You played my entire video and you didn't give me a fair chance! You fucking dickless suck! God, you're such cowards! Such fucking stinking, lousy cowards! What more can I give you, you fucking goddamn coward? I'm giving you every advantage. I'm tying my hands behind my back. I'm saying, give me your fucking argument. Give me your fucking links. I'll disprove your shit. I'll play your 60 symbols videos, and I'll show how they're full of shit. What more can I do? What, what fucking other advantage can I give you, you fucking cunt? And what do you do to me? You quote mine my videos. You pull out this part. Oh, look how hysterical he is. Look what a lunatic he is. I won't play the fucking videos where he actually spends 99% of his time drawing it over and over again. I won't actually quote him honestly. You're such fucking cheaters. God, fuck, the human race cannot be killed soon enough if this is what it's going to sit there and say is this is a good human. This man is protecting the truth. This lying wimp.